everybody. Tonight is um, episode 11 of season two. You're um, at another riveting Zoom garden plot um, event. We have a lot going on tonight, so we're going to be really challenged to keep it under an hour. Um, we have a guest from the Florida Public Library. Michael, do you know if Baron is here? He's here. He's here. He's here. Okay, so I'm not trying. I'm going to try not to get ahead of myself. Um, let's look at the agenda for tonight. Well, Baron is going to be up first. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a guest speaker from the Florida Public Library talking to us about their tool library. Then we are going to be discussing and talking about and putting out votes for your favorite garden tools. And some folks did send in their pictures. So thank you for that. We always love and appreciate pictures. We've got updates from so many people. Um, I think at some point we got confused as to whose turn it was. We were taking turns sort of in a way, but in yes. the end, everybody yeah. you know contributed pictures and we love to show them. So everybody is gonna you know, just keep sending them. We'll keep showing them. We've got Michael. We're gonna hear from the Greenwood Lake Community Garden. We've got Bill and Mary's Garden and Leslie's Garden. Finally, we have um, the usual Q&A. We have some questions um, and then we'll finish up with announcements halfway through. If someone can remind me, if I don't remember, please remind me that we do our shimmy in place just to stretch ourselves out at about 8.30ish. So without further ado, we're going to continue on and I'm going to introduce Baron Angel. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Baron? Are you there? He is the librarian oh, and- Sorry about that, my headset was muted, I apologize. There you go. Hello. And yes, Hello. you did pronounce that right. You're one of the few people that usually that did on the first try, so. Whoops, let me just go back a second. Okay. So Baron, let me, just, let me just go back again and say that, I don't know if people heard that you are the librarian, the program coordinator for the Florida Public Library, and you've so generously agreed to come and speak with us tonight about what you have going on at the library. Yes, thank you, and a uh, big thank you to Michael for inviting me and for uh, making me aware of this so I could uh, stop by and talk about this. Uh, whoop, the screen share just turned off. I can turn it back on and show whichever of the two slides you send through when you're ready. You just let me know. Okay, I sent a, bun I sent a bunch of different ones, so I don't know how many he gave you, but either way, that, 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 that first one you had up was the important one, so. Okay, so do you want me to put that back up? Um, if you want to go ahead, I can go first real quick. Um, and secondly, the reason we want to talk about this is we have recently started a library of things. We've had it for about six or seven months now. And the idea is that libraries mostly are known for loaning out books and DVDs, but a lot of libraries, both locally and across the country, are starting to loan out all kinds of other items that people might have a use for occasionally, but might be expensive and might be something they don't want to spend the money on and have around for something they would use on a single job. So we've started expanding a collection that we've put together of various items ranging from tools to gardening items, which I will uh, talk a little bit in more detail here since that's obviously the relevant topic for tonight, but also um, regular kinds of tools for different projects. We have cooking items, different types of baking pans, cake pans, things like that. We have um, a variety of games, board games, uh, some video games for kids, things like that. We've got a variety of outdoor games. We just got in a few things such as a uh, cornhole, uh, badminton, volleyball set, things like that. And we're always looking for uh, additional items to uh, expand the collection with to see what else we can put out there that uh, people might want to use and are, and are interested in. Um, all the items can be found on our website, floridapubliclibrary.org. And once you're in there, we do have individual pictures of each of the items and they're separated by category. Uh, what did I forget? Oh, we also have some arts and crafts items. We have some knitting kits, uh, loom kits, things like that. Uh, we've also got some uh, miscellaneous items, some uh, fishing rods. Uh, we have some ukuleles, uh, sets for both kids and adults. We have a canopy that you can rent if you're doing an outdoor event of some kind. It's a 10 by 10. Uh, a shredder, a metal detector, all kinds of things. And I have a picture of some of the gardening items that I'll show off. Uh, right here, but these are all items um, they can be checked out from the Florida Library uh, to anybody with an adult library card in the Ramapo Catskill Library system. That includes Warwick, Florida, Goshen, Chester, pretty much anything in Orange, Sullivan, Rockland, or Southern Ulster County. So all you have to do is come to us. We'll check the items out on your card. There is a waiver we ask everyone to sign, just saying that you understand that some of these items could potentially be dangerous. 
you take the liability in your hands, you affirm that you know how to use these items, you're responsible for the usages, any damages incurred, so on and so forth. And we'll keep that on file for the duration of the time you have it. And then you get the item for one week and then you can bring it back when you're done. We do ask that uh, any items that are used be cleaned and returned as best they can in the condition they were checked out. And they'll be there for the next person that wants them. Um, they cannot be reserved. Like sometimes you can reserve books and have them be held for you. We don't generally do that with these items, uh, but they are definitely um, easily, if you call ahead to ask, we'll let you know if something is there or not. So you can always give us a call and find out something is there. And if it's not, we can give you an idea of when it's gonna be back. Um, uh, the fines on the items are such that most people don't want to keep them late. So uh, for something like this, obviously, all of these items are somewhat expensive. So things um, some of these we did purchase through partnerships with our uh, local hardware stores, um, Warner's True Value right down Main Street and uh, Roe Brothers Hardware around the corner. And they've been very helpful in providing a lot of the, the tools and gardening items specifically so that we have those available. And some of the other ones we supplemented by buying on Amazon. Uh, or with donations from people who uh, had items that they wanted to, you know, that they thought could be used, but that they didn't have a personal use for anymore. Um, on that note, one of the reasons I wanted to uh, present this here, and, and Michael is nice enough to offer, is that we are currently in the process of planning and implementing a program that we received a grant for from the uh, Small and Rural Libraries Initiative through the American Library Association. And what that's going to allow us to do is host a community conversation on a topic of our choice. The topic in question that we're going to do is regarding our library of things and how that can be used in conjunction with the Warwick Repair Cafe and similar efforts through Sustainable Warwick and Sustainable Hudson Valley in order to uh, help facilitate the repair or upcycle of items that might have otherwise been thrown out, whether items that people simply don't have the tools or the materials to repair or things they might not even have thought to repair. Uh, we're going to be hosting a community conversation on the night of Wednesday, August 11th. It'll be on the back deck of the Florida Library, and we're inviting anybody who would like to come to please come. Let us know what items you think our Library of Things could use, um, what kinds of repairs you would like to see or have done, if it's something the Repair Cafe already does, if it's something the Repair Cafe could do if it had the right materials. We're just trying to get a conversation started on what repair cafes are, what they could do for our community, how we can promote this, and how this could tie into the general goal of helping to preserve the environment of our local area. Obviously, we have a lot of farmland and things of that nature. The environment is very important to our local community, whether it be Warwick, Florida, or otherwise, and we want to help facilitate that goal as much as possible. Uh, the granted question was about $3,000, so anything, the ideas that we come up with, we will use that to purchase the items for our library of things, or pursue other initiatives that are needed in conjunction with this in order to try to help make the ideas that we come up with at the conversation happen in whatever way we can. Um, if future conversations are warranted, if it seems like we have a good turnout, we will host future conversations, but we'll determine that after the first one. Um, in the meantime, just to give you an idea of some of the things we already have in our library of things, just so you get an idea of what we're looking for, if it comes up with any ideas that you have either tonight, or if you'd like to come to our meeting on the 11th to uh, bring those ideas, um, if you could put the slide up, I'll talk about some of the items there. I would appreciate it. There we go. So um, this is a collection of our gardening related items here. Um, and again, if you have a Warwick uh, or Florida or even Greenwood Lake Library card, you're welcome to come and check any of these out. Uh, we have a variety of rakes and shovels for different purposes here. Uh, we have a couple of different saws. Let me hang on a moment here. I, uh, if I just do this real quick, I can actually get this over here. Let me open this. Okay. So yes, as you can see, things we have a bow rake, a leaf rake, and a shrub rake, different shovels for digging, round point, square point. We have a gardening tool set with a trowel cultivator and transplanter. That comes, those three come together, just a basic set. It comes in a little carry bag, uh, a turf edger, uh, loppers for uh, branches, uh, pruners for smaller shrubs and things, a bone saw and a folding saw again toward branches. We have a post hole digger, which is great if you're trying to plant any trees or larger items uh, as part of your efforts. Uh, pole saw loppers, the, uh, the yellow one there with the blade that looks like it's in a plastic package, that extends up to 14 feet if you're dealing with high tree branches or other things that are difficult to reach. We have a weed whacker blower combo set here. Those are electric. They run off of a uh, extension cord. So easy enough to plug in and use, no gas required. 
We have a seed fertilizer and spreader, the green Scots there. So if you don't happen to have one and you're looking to easily spread seeds over a wide area or put fertilizer around your garden, it's great for that. And again, we're always looking for ideas for items. I know one thing Michael had already uh, passed along is he had told me that somebody here was uh, very excited about their skidger that they got. So we're looking to get one, looking to get one of those. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> very good, Michael. <laughs> but we're, 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 we're looking to get one. I, I passed that on to my director because it looks like it's their, uh, it's sold through their own website. We have to set up a specific purchase order and things to buy that, or one of us buys it, has to buy it personally and then get reimbursed on it. So we're going to figure that out, but it's on our list of things to buy that is always expanding. So we are always looking for ideas. Um, with the other slide I put up that does show some of our other tools, some of our, on our non-gardening items, just to give you an idea um, of some of our other things. And again, the pictures for all of these are on the website. Um, if you have the other slide there, if you just want to put it up for a moment, I'll just. Yeah, the uh, one with the flyer, yeah. Yeah, that, well, yeah, that, that is just some information. These are some of the other non-gardening tools that we do have available. Um, you can see we do have a circular saw there. We do have a drill set that comes with drill bits and uh, driving bits and other things you might need. We have a general toolbox, comes with a standard set of tools, hammers, wrench, pliers, screwdrivers. Uh, I believe it has some sockets in it, things like that. Um, we do have a variety of hand tools, hand saws, wrenches, uh, hammers, things like that. We have socket sets. Um, any, there's a lot of things I could mention that uh, I, I think our tools are the, the largest area of things that we have so far in the library of things right now. But as I mentioned, uh, Werner's and Roe Brothers are very helpful in providing items for that at a, uh, an affordable rate for us. So that was really helpful. Uh, we also have some other items that are fall into tools, but uh, less expected maybe. We have a set of jumper cables, uh, a battery maintainer for batteries for any uh, things that you might use, uh, a voltage tester to test your outlets or light fixtures. We have uh, caulking gun. We have a wood carving set for that sort of thing. We have a reel with a polyline and a chalk mark if you're using that kind of a thing, if you're trying to mark out where things are going to be before you set them up. Winches, tin snips, crowbars, sledgehammers, extension cords, pretty much anything you can imagine. If it's a tool, we probably have it. And if we don't, we can get it. Uh, stud finder, that's important. Uh, rubber mallet, uh, pipe wrenches. Like I said, many, many things that we do have available. Um, again, if you come and see us, as long as you have your library card with you, we're happy to check those out to you. Um, a lot of those items were paid for thanks to fun, uh, existing items were paid for thanks to funding from uh, former Senator Jen Metzger, as well as a Friends of the Library and some donations from other individuals who helped us out. So we do thank them a lot for helping us get started with this collection, which um, from what I understand from speaking to um, Melissa Everett of Sustainable Hudson Valley is apparently the first tool library of its kind in the Hudson Valley area, although others are in the process of uh, working on, are essentially in the process of setting themselves up. I know specifically one up in Hudson, New York uh, is working on it. They contacted me to try to get some ideas on what they were working on. So we're hoping to see this idea kind of spread of things that libraries can have available that you wouldn't necessarily expect items that you know, people can use that they, again, I said before, might not want to purchase, but might want to either try out to determine if they want to purchase it, or that they might only use once and might not be able to afford. And it spreads far beyond that as well. Um, I know the Repair Cafe does a wide array of repairs ranging from expected kinds of things, you know, repair of a, of a, you know, of a table or something like that, or a chair, but also things like repairing lamps and electronics, computer repairs, they handle um, all kinds of unique things. I know a lot of um, repair cafes are expanding into repairs, even of things like uh, old photographs, how to restore those, how to restore antiques, things like that. Um, Aaron, that's I wonderful. I know Michael's had his hand up for a little while, so I'm just going to- Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see him. Go ahead, Michael. Michael and give him a chance. Um, when I looked at just things of stuff, I was really hoping that we could have some of our gardeners jump in and say, what could you add to the tools? And I'm, I want to throw the first Absolutely. thing on the pile. And I was thinking like, if a gardener doesn't have a trowel, I don't know what they're gonna do if they're borrowed for a week, but what they really could use for a week is a pick. Cause if you're gonna dig, okay. if you're gonna do a digging project, you don't dig with a shovel, you pick first and then you, and then you use a shovel. So okay. a nice pick with one end sharp, the other end sort of a, you know, a, a shape blade. That's the sort of thing that somebody would wanna borrow for a week and then their bag would be thrown out, but their job would be done and they'd bring it back. 
Mm. Okay, that's a great idea. Very good point. Does anybody me... else have any uh, suggestions for Baron while we have his ear? I'm so sorry to be like a Debbie Downer and not, not to make a suggestion, but I'm just curious if there's any kind of liability or what the late fees are for these or anything like that. Like, do you need an age limit? Like, what's the deal? Um, so the rules are, are that uh, you, the library card used to check it out must be an adult card, which would anybody be anybody 18 years of age or older. They have to be able to legally sign the waivers. Um, the late fees after uh, seven days, if it's not returned within a week, is $2 per day per item. Um, up to two items can be checked out at a time. And um, like I said, we ask that things be uh, returned to clean and in good condition, but the, um, the waiver and indemnification form are on the website. And so that can be here. I'll actually, I'll put it, if anybody wants to read it, I'll put it in the, uh, in the chat here so everybody can take a look. Very cool. I was just wondering, I, you know, cause you're running yeah, out like but a But that's, yeah, level. that's the waiver. Absolutely. Like I said, we, we had our attorney go over the, the, the waiver and indemnification forms with a fine tooth comb. So it yeah, is, uh, it's sorry. all set up. It's, um, sorry, somebody speaking. Uh, no, yeah, ba Baron, first of all, I want to say you, you should be an announcer. You have an excellent announcing voice. <laughs> Thank you. For, for someone in the library who's not supposed to talk, you, I, know, I don't know if you're in the right place. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, I think this is an amazing idea. I, I think I'm all about, I'm very big into transition towns and seed libraries and two libraries. But I, I am wondering, like, so the hardware store is not at all upset or uh, like doesn't this kind of cut into their business, I was just thinking? Um, no, truth be told, that's from what, from what uh, we in libraries have noticed for places that have done this is that's sort of a common misconception because more likely than not, if somebody, you know, if somebody needs something once, they weren't going to buy it either way. And this way they have it. And if they buy it and they realize this is something they're going to use, yeah, rather than have to have it for a week and constantly get it over and over again, they're more likely to go to the hardware store and buy one for themselves <laughs> now that they know how it works and they know they like it. Mm -hmm. I love it. I'm a big fan. I, I, so what, what time is that? Uh, you said the 11th. What time is the... Uh, uh, it's August 11th. It's going to be at 630. It's on our online calendar on floridapubliclibrary.org. Uh, if you're going to attend, we do ask that you register. That way we have an idea of how many people are coming. We know how many chairs to put out and how many refreshments to have and things of that nature. And this will be in person. Okay. This will be in person on our back deck. Yes. Uh, weather permitting, if it does rain, we will reschedule it and we'll deal with that uh, as needed. Aaron, we want to thank you for your participation, for sharing this exciting uh, venture with us. I'm sure you're going to get a good turnout. We'll, you yes, know, we, we have a we have a variety of organizations that are participating already. Um, I, I know uh, some people from um, Sustainable Warwick are going to be there. A representative from the Repair Cafe is going to be there. We have um, we're hoping to have uh, representatives from Warders and Robe Others present to uh, talk about their side of things. Uh, we're going to be uh, having members of the Friends of the Library. A few of our trustees will be there, and we're trying to spread that out further to see if other organizations want to attend. Um, Assemblyman Carl Bravenick dropped by our library the other day. I mentioned it to him. I don't necessarily expect him to come, but the word's out there. Um, and I'm also going to send an email over to um, Paul Ruskevich at the county to see if he might be interested in stopping by or having one of his people pay us a visit at that meeting as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And this is a good jumping off point for everybody to jump in and tell us what your favorite tools are. Um, so let me share my screen with you. So let's talk about what your favorite tools are. Mine's on the right, Nicole's. We know all about yours. I actually bought one on your recommendation. Did you use it yet? I did not. <laughs> we need a full review to use it. What do, you, what do you mostly use it for? Literally just for weeding or do you use it for anything else? Uh, I've just weeded with it. Just weeding, okay. It looks like it can be done, used for many, many different things because it's got a nice long handle. It's got a nice point. Um, I don't know, how long have you had yours? Just this season. Just this season, okay. Just this season. And I only weeded before I put down all the mulch. And then, um, you know, then I had no drip irrigation. I've just been pulling out the weeds that have lived. Okay, okay. And how does it do with rocks? Fine. It's, I mean, I, I have some rocks in my soil, not a whole heck of a lot of them. But I'll tell you this, like, I thought I was weeding, but I was actually chopping like turnips and carrots in half that had seeded and been left there. So, I mean, if it took down a carrot out of the soil and a turnip, uh, it, come on, you gotta get on the skidger train. You gotta okay. try. 
tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. I'm not so, sponsor, I'm not sponsoring this item again. <laughs> so my favorite tools on the right, they're ergonomic. Uh, for, oh. What do you call that thing that's on the very left there? The thing that looks like the a cultivator. Oh, thank you. A cultivator and a little hand trowel. And the reason it's shaped like an owl is that it's considered an ergonomic tool. Mm. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer because, you know, just the shape of the handle doesn't necessarily make it ergonomic. If you're positioned in a really awkward posture while you're digging, you're certainly not being ergonomic in your gardening. But it generally decreases the force with which you have to grasp a handle. And for folks who have hand arthritis, I'm a hand therapist, for those of you who don't know. Um, I specialize uh, in upper extremities. So I get a lot of people right around now that come to me with hand arthritis and they say, I love to garden, but I hurt. Yeah. So then I generally send them to either Amazon or arthritissupplies.com. And um, I'm not, you know, per participating in any way as a sponsor, but um, they do sell some nifty tools where generally the handles are enlarged and or at a 90 degree angle, which makes the force with which you hmm. have to work less. Um, we have one more. Whoops, let's see if I can advance the slide. There we go. Chad, tell us about this one. It's my, I don't know what the name of it. It's just like an old thing. I, I just love it. Like, it's like my little lawnmower. I just whack, you know, you wind up like a golf swing and you just chop down you know, tall weeds. I, I do. I think it's really fast and efficient. Is it a so, serrated edge on both sides there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's a, yeah that was one. Yeah. You know, I had a job when I was a young kid. I enjoyed that. Like I would chop all these weeds down. And I guess I just love the taking out my aggression and just chopping down the weeds. You, you can do them pretty quickly. Where so that's my, you, that's my old school it? weed whacker. Old school. Where did you get your weed whacker? At a garage sale for like a dollar. I love it. Oh my goodness. And, it, and it, I was, I was, I was always thinking back to when I had that job when I worked in the city and when I was like 14, I was like, oh, there, I found one. So, you know, I just go out and, you know, I, it's not the greatest around, you know, tight little spots, but mm -hmm. like even in the community garden near the, near the back, there's a lot of, uh, gets very damp and wet. So I just walk back there and chop them down in two minutes. I just whack them all down to, you know, a low level. So Have you I, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's a old school weed whacker. Anybody else have any favorite tools? Maybe you didn't send a picture, but you'd like to tell us about it. There, there's one I've had pictures before, and that is, oh, and Jane is lining up there. What is that? It's an edger. <gasps> oh, wow. I can't handle the, the rocking one. I can never get it right. Whereas this one just goes in and I do like that. And it's a big chunk and it has edges on it. And it just, it goes, plus it has the handle. So oh, I'm able to, it, I push it like a shovel and then just flip it. And it's, it's great big chunks. I'm, I'm very into edges and mulch. So, <laughs> I mean, it's wonderful. I love it. So Jane, I have an edger that's just, I guess, the straight piece. And when I use it, like when I chopped out my garden originally, I had to go on either side and then through. Does having that piece there, I guess, in the leverage, make it so you don't have to do two cuts and you can still take it out? Uh, I can still, I can still, I usually go like this so that it's, it's that, and I go in like that and I go like that. Sometimes I do, if the chunk is so big, I have to go to this side and do it that way. Right. But normally this will, I get chunks of sod and stuff up wonderfully. And I think it's the handle that I like too, because, and I can put my foot on, I put my foot here and with a hand, I love it. Cause I could not handle that single pole with the, the rocking thing. Yeah. Cool. Who makes that one? Uh, it's the weasel. They cool. also make that tine thing that uh, I, I have that too, but I don't use it that often. Weasel edger chopper. I love it. Thank you. Weasel. Say that again, Jane. Weasel. It's weasel. Oh, fantastic edger chopper. Is it back? Is it backwards to you? No. Oh, that's mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't cheap. My friend went to get it and it was like, it wasn't that cheap, but it's very solid and I love it. I just love it. Awesome. Anybody else? I, I will oh, just say very quickly, some, something I mentioned, mentioned before, my Soil Sifter Deluxe. Uh, it, uh, you know, one end sits up on the end of a ladder and the other is the, onto the ground and I have a huge area that I can put uh, 
sifts oil through. Uh, and this is it's something commercial. Else you didn't make it. No, I made it. Made it. Oh, okay. Friend, help me make it. That that's something else that you use like for a week, and could return to the library if the library has a spot big enough for a soil sifter deluxe. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I think you wanted to say something. Sorry, I jumped on your. No, that's okay. I was going to say, um, I found some pictures before. Um, one was this this uh, shovel that's I call it the Terminator. I forget what it's called, but it's it's very sharp and it's designed to cut bamboo, but it's really good for breaking up heavy soil. The two other shovels I have are they're designed for perennial flower beds. Mm. And they're, the blades are, they're stainless. The blades are a little bit longer than normal, but they're thin. They're maybe, I don't know, eight or nine inches wide instead of the shovel size. And one has this pointed shovel shape and the other is like a spade. But because they're thinner in width, they're designed to get in to transplant without taking out more plants or dirt than you want to. So I like the. Sarah, you put yourself on mute. Can you unmute yourself? The other thing that's really useful to have is a, uh, they make different ones. I have one from Fiskars. It's a long, like garden knife. And it has a flat side and a serrated side. They're about 12 inches long, but for um, transplanting. She's holding one up. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. Great. I love it. Those are really, really you want one of those. You can yeah. stick it down and wiggle it back and forth and make your transplant hole. <laughs> they work yep. really well. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot of tools, but I, those are some that I would never give up. I have something like Chad has, and I think I used it once. <laughs> you don't go to the Florida library. <laughs> so that thing that Chad has is a grass whip. His is a yeah. so needed grass whip. Oh. Super cool. Right. Wow. It got too close to my toes. That's why I didn't use that. <laughs> anyway, you know, those are some tools that are you don't you don't see them in the hardware store sometimes, but they're really, really useful tools. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. Everybody, it's 8:30. So we're gonna take a minute to shimmy in place or stand up and walk around, and we'll see you back here at 8:31. Thanks. We're gonna get started. Michelle, by the way, I'm not. I don't. I don't think this is my week. So if you don't. You know, don't. I just sent them. I totally can't remember who was supposed to do updates this week. So, so I mean, I mean if you, do you if mind we're falling behind, no, no, I don't mind. But I'm saying, if, you know, if we're overwhelmed, then you can skip me. Don't worry. Fine, you could just be brief. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, everybody. So we're gonna show the slides with the Greenwood Lake Community Garden. Actually, I'm sorry getting ahead of myself. We're gonna look at Michael's garden updates first. Um, I wasn't thinking that was really a garden update. I think I just sent a couple pictures. And so I will go through them very quickly. Okay, let me share. So we can get to a real garden update. This is just something of a couple things of interest that I wanted to share. Go ahead, Michael. So on the left, um, that's our amaranth. Um, and 
And sort of toward the front, if you look closely, there is some purple perilla. Uh, the amaranth is, uh, all the leaves on that are completely edible uh, and it's self-seeded. So that's a lot of food right there and very little work. And we love it. It's nice texture, a nice flavor. Uh, if you want to stop by and get some, I have some extra plants that I could just cut down and you could take a couple plants home and, and I could trade some seeds at the end. And toward the bottom, there is, um, is some perilla. It's also purple perilla. And um, I, 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 I think there's some cutting edge research that's about to be published on these plants that show that these are loaded with vegetables, P-U-R-P-L and E. Really, it's hard to get those P U R P L and E veg, uh, vitamins. So, mm. um, uh, mm. I, I think that's. And then over on the right hand side, um, we've got two um, hazelnut bushes. Uh, gosh, and I sent another picture. Is, there, is that on the next slide? Yes. Okay, and that's yeah. a close up of one of the hazelnuts. It's the first year we're getting nuts on these. And I just thought it would be cool for people to see. The bushes are maybe four years old now. We've got two of them, and they're. They're, I, I do hardly anything for them, and they're, they seem to be happy, and uh, we might get hazelnuts this year. It's really exciting. How tall are they? I'm sorry? How tall are they now? Uh, five feet. Wow, that's great. I'm over yeah. for some Nutella next year. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, did you start them from seed, or did you buy them as sapling? I, I got them from uh, Midsummer Farm. Oh. Got it. And actually, what she did was got, she, I believe she got them from um, uh, Badger. What is it? There's a Badger Farms or something. It's in Wisconsin. And she, they sent her the seedlings and she got them through the first year or something and then sold them to me. Because I had also got some from Badger originally and I didn't ever, it, did, it didn't work out. <laughs> oh, exciting. Okay, so we're gonna, after Michael's update, we're gonna look at the Greenwood Lake Community Garden. I'm just gonna share my screen again. Okay, and go ahead, Chad. All right, I'll, again, I wasn't, I'm all confused, but I'll give an update anyway, let's see. Uh, we got onions, really. I know you guys, uh, you said to wait till they turn brown, but they like, they seem to be really popping out of the ground, so. I don't know, uh, I, maybe Bill could help me out to say if I should just pick them at this point or wait until the leaves just flop over. Um, so those are onions are looking quite beautiful. I got from Christopher Harrison. Um, then the next picture is uh, the perennials we planted a few weeks ago. And it's kind of hard to see, but you know, there's elderberry in there and currants and all type of uh, raspberries. And um, you know, hopefully they'll, they're not gated off at, at all. So we're hoping deer won't chew them all down mm. if you want to go i think i sent a few more and you can see my beautiful shadow i'm a great photographer <laughs> uh you got tomatoes are getting very close uh and then what is that I even i put there uh oh those are carrots and beets awesome. also appear to be ready to harvest so just showing you know guns coming on very well the, the fence took a really long time to fit but we finally finished the fence that that really Took a lot of our time. It's a great and, uh, yeah, yeah, it's coming on very nicely. And thanks to Sarah, it helped out a lot. But my little mentor. And, uh, you know, hopefully every year we'll I'll learn a little bit more and get better and better for this. That's coming along nicely. Awesome. Thank you, Chad. You awesome, Chad. I drove by the other day. Kudos. Oh, thank you. Oh, and you you have some, well, your peppers are coming in very nicely. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a look at Bill and Mary's garden. I'm going to share my screen again. Go ahead, Bill, if you're there. Okay, I am here. Uh, I hope everybody is enjoying their semi-tropical uh, rainforest this summer. You've had a lot of rain. Uh, anyway, on the left is the garlic. The garlics have turned three quarters brown and uh, I uh, just harvested them and now I'm putting them out so they can uh, sit outside for maybe two or three weeks. And then I'll put them in the basement in a cool, cool spot. So they need to be aired. They need to be in a, a not in the sun uh, and they need to be protected from rain uh, as, you, as you cure them. Mm. Uh, on the right side are onions and uh, 
and, and Chad mentioned, I think your onions are a little late in terms of their size. Uh, mine get to a certain height and then they fall over. So you can see the, the onions are falling over. And once that happens, uh, the onions of the same size, you can just push them over. In other words, to keep everything the same, you just push over the other onions and then they brown up, the, the leaves brown up and start to disappear actually. Uh, they, and so at that point, you can pull them out of the ground. It may take two or three weeks for that to happen. And, and then you do the same thing as with garlic. You put them in a, in a place that's dry and uh, a place that uh, uh, is uh, not in the sun and you let them uh, be there for a while. So mm -hmm. maybe two months. Okay, I keep mine out until it gets cool because my basement is warm. And so uh, the onions are better off, I think, under my uh, carport uh, being kept cool by the, the decreasing temperatures in September, October, than they are being put directly into the basement in, you know, in uh, August. So, so, okay. so, just, so just, just to clarify, so I kind of push them down, push, push them the down. leaves down, right? then let them stay there for a few weeks and they'll, the leaves will just turn brown and kind they of dissipate. They'll turn brown. When they're totally brown and the, and the leaves are almost separated from the plant, it's just a, a small attachment. Just pull them up, wipe them off, and put them in a dry, uh, non-sunny place for uh, a month, two months, whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Bill. I have a quick question for you. In terms of seed garlic, do you plant the cloves of your garlic that you've harvested again in the fall, or do you get new, what's co considered seed garlic every year? Uh, I've done both. Uh, sometimes I, I use my own garlic and sometimes I buy some. Uh, I find if my garlic is really big and it's, it's good quality, I'll use that. Otherwise I'll buy new garlic. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I've varied year from year, but they, they, the garlic grows pretty much the same whether you use your own or whether you uh, buy some. Thank you. And you mentioning that you plant the ones that are really nice and big, um, that sounds, it's beginning to sound or it reminds me of something called a land race. And I don't know if you folks are familiar with it. Maybe it's a topic for another night's discussion that a lot of the permaculture forums, um, folks are producing their own, own land races, but mm -hmm. I'm not gonna take over that conversation. That's, as I said, best safe for another night. So right. thank you, Bill. We're gonna take a look at Leslie's garden next. Okay. Leslie, you have quite a few pictures. So tell us what's going on here. Well, the one on the left is from last week, but I oh. sent that because the one on the right is like, this is how much has grown just in the week. Oh, wow. And I actually, um, I didn't intend to harvest some of those peppers because they were just starting to turn orange and weren't quite, but I broke the stem, so <laughs> I cut them off. But this is, you can see the little new one um, growing in the, on the right. Mm -hmm. And um, But things with all the rain and the heat this week have been doing really well. And um, the composter, you know, it's been, I've been feeling that twice a week lately. You know, yeah, it's like I go out there on Wednesday and it's all the way, you know, almost um, two thirds gone and then fill it up again and, and start. So it's, it's been kind of fun. And in the um, next one, um, those are the tomatoes that um, just cherry tomatoes that I have on the other end of the um, keyhole garden on the right side. And um, so they're doing pretty well with the trellis. At first I hadn't put the, um, the red trellis on all of them and they were just kind of spreading out and laying down. They weren't really being um, contained by that little silver um, cage around them, but the two together seem to work well. The uh, middle one is um, my celery. And that again, just shot up in this last year. And the picture on the right was just some something that was fun. I didn't take a lot because I was out. And by the time I took that snap, all of a sudden the skies opened up yesterday and it started pouring. But I have a monarch butterfly on the um, sunflower on top and then a bee um, on that, is the very um, oh, yeah. lowest flower, yeah. So the, the uh, bee and the sunflower and the uh, 
butterfly were hanging out together. I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, but nice. I have um, lots of bees because I have the Mexican sunflowers and the Russian sage growing in each corner. And, um, and a lot of butterflies, just in the last, I'd say five or six days, I had a lot of the plain butterflies coming before, just like the plain white ones are a little bit yellow. But this past week, there have been swarms of the monarchs, which are, I don't know why, but they're always just wonderful to see. <laughs> they're very welcome, right? Yeah. And there's two more from your garden. Oh, here. I forgot about that. <laughs> the, um, the one on the left with the little yellow flower is my um, fennel. And I wasn't sure how well that was going to grow because when I put it in, it looked deader than the doornail. And it didn't do anything for the longest time, but it's right behind the composting section. I figured I'd put it there and see what happened. And so that's doing really well. And I asked um, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, if anyone had ever grown melons in um, an instant pot, not an instant pot, an earth box, because I've tried it before, but the groundhogs have always gotten them. So this time I thought, put them in the, um, I've had them in the ground. This time I put it in the earth box, but this is the third one. I cut one off um, on Friday and brought it in. It was very good. And I'm going to leave this one um, a little longer. And there's another one that's out of frame because the one I brought in was um, starting to be red and sweet. But I figure if I leave it longer, it'll give, get even a more, um, it'll get deeper red. And I'll see how that tastes. But um, I finally have beaten the uh, groundhog. So I'm very happy about that. <laughs> what was the red underneath your melon? There was something red under there. Oh, what that's that? on the earth box. It's just the, um, the cover to cover the soil. And so you put the, you know, you cut a, um, a hole in the um, cover. They have white covers, black and red. And the red is good for like tomatoes and, um, melon supposedly. So I put the red cover on and then, um, you know, you dig a, put a hole in it and then just put the seedling in. And um, they were doing nothing for a long time. And all of a sudden, there they are. I had three of them. And I wasn't sure what size really lets me know it's fully ripe. So the one I brought in was a little bit better, um, bigger than the one you see there. But still, it was like starting to be red, but not deep, deep red. So I'm going to leave these others and uh, see what happens. Do they ripen after you pick them or no? I think they do, but I don't think a lot. Okay. You know, I think they will ripen a little bit. It's like if you cut, um, I found with bell peppers, like if I break them off and wait for them to ripen in the, in the house, they don't really, they kind of a little bit and then they start looking like they're going to get soft. So I just chop them up and cook them. You know, yeah. I think melons are the same way. Okay, okay, thank you. I heard an interesting thing this week from a farmer that if you leave the stem on a slightly um, red tomato, mostly green with a little bit of red, if you leave the stem on, it has a greater chance of ripening further. Did not know Oh, that. really? Yep. I'll try that. Yeah. Because usually by the time we get into fall, I've got lots of tomatoes left, you know, and it's going to get too cold for them to do well. Exactly, exactly. Well, thank you, Leslie. That was great. Thank you, Leslie, Michael, Bill, Chad. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the next slide is our Q&A. Um, we have questions about potato losses, and there's a question about perennial veggies and flowers again. So the first one is about potatoes. Go ahead, Michael. Okay, so wow. This, I have, this has never happened to me before. So um, if you look, um, that bucket on the left is like a five gallon bucket and about two gallons worth are, came with rotten potatoes. So you see I have that, there's the cedar log on the left and then there's that spruce board. And what I did was in this patch, I thought, oh, I'll sort of plant the potatoes next to this board, which I got at uh, Row Lumber. I was there to get something else, and this was in the in the dumpster because it had it was sort of cracked or something, and so they couldn't sell it. But they gave it to me for free, and I thought, oh, I can find a use for it. So my idea was to sort of heal up soil against this board, so mm -hmm. that I could heal them higher. Um, and everything to the left, I thought, oh, I will just harvest some of my potatoes today. And everything to the left, you can sort of see in that bucket; those are all rotting potatoes. They have this white stuff growing on them. Some of them were actually like a little bit of oozy, some of them were just completely mush. 
Um, on the right there, I still have some potato plants that are, you know, they're getting tired because they're that's they're in that stage. And you can see I did get one plant, uh, not just a little bit above where that bowl is now, that had some good potatoes in it. And I like to plant blue potatoes. Um, so I've got a number of questions about this. And so I'm, I'm so pleased we have the panel of experts here tonight to answer. Do you want to take this, this slide down and stop sharing for a minute? So is that like, is that something in the soil that's messing up the potatoes or was it just overly moist, you suppose, this year? Or, or, and then what should I be growing in the soil afterwards? What can I do to make the soil nicer? Um, but that, my first question is, when your potatoes come out with this white stuff on them and they're all mushy, is that like some sort of infection or something? You know, Michael, I don't know what the name of it is, but I, it's obviously some sort of, uh, you know, Hi. disease. And uh, it may be this year due to the large amount of rain that we've had under, you know, the past few weeks. I think we've had 15 inches of rain over two or three weeks, uh, at least I have. And I think that could be part of the problem. They probably don't like sitting in that much water. But uh, I'm just guessing, I'm not sure. It, was it not draining? Is it not an area where it drains? You know, it's it's like, a, it's a raised bed. Um, when I got there and dug stuff out, it wasn't like they were swimming in water. The soil, I would say was, was was moist, but it wasn't like mud. What makes you think it's not blight? Hmm. Uh, Just out of curiosity. I had never seen blight before, but it, I mean- It kind of looks like, it looks like what I've been told blight looks like, where they get they get basically nasty. They're mush, they're gooey, they're icky. Um, did, and did the plants look unhealthy? The the plants look the plants look fine, you know, up until I pulled them out. I could see huh. there was like a white powdery stuff, like between where the where the plant connected to the you know down into the soil and was connecting to the to the potato. It sounds a lot like blight. Like anytime, um, I've done a lot of research on the Irish potato famine just because I'm a history nerd. And it, one of the things about the famine was it took them by surprise that they dug up their potatoes and found that they were nasty. So it sounds like some type of blight. I would uh, rotate out of that bed and not, you, not use that bed for any nightshades uh, family uh, for the next two years and, and just see what happens. That's my suggestion. It, Anything particular that I could plant besides non nightshades there? And by the way, there are tomatoes just north of there. And I've, that was about, um, I had about four rows of potatoes. Uh, I got out and dug up the first row today, but I'm thinking, should I just dig up all the others in that patch like as soon as possible? I have no idea. You said the plants looked fine. So that's what's so weird to me. If those other ones are looking tired and they're getting ready to be the end of the season, I would say dig them up anyway. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but anything that isn't a nightshade, you could put there. You could put any type, anything in the brassica family. You could grow lettuce. You could grow uh, squash. You could grow anything that isn't a tomato, a potato, or a pepper. Okay. okay. Is there, um, let's see. For what it's worth, um, the farmer's market uh, that I go to the, one of the vendors there has potatoes and a lot of them were coming out like you were describing and uh, they were describing it to too much water also. So it could be a combination problem. Okay. How, how do you know when your potatoes are ready? Because I know I remember reading saying when the, um, the greenery gets um, yellow, then it's, you know, don't water them anymore. Um, mm -hmm. or move them out of the rain this season. But mine um, are still very green. Like on um, when I went out Sunday, um, one was drying out, so I didn't bother worrying. But then the skies open, so that's soaking wet. But they were starting to get a little um, a little brown. Those were the blue potatoes. The red potatoes that I have were still vibrant green. So do you always wait for the um, the greens to wilt and brown before um, starting to dig them up? Do they have flowers? Um, the blue potatoes didn't have flowers anymore. The, the ones that were starting to brown a little bit. The so others had a couple of flowers, the red potatoes. 
So the rule that I understand it is if your potatoes have flowers, you can you can dig for new potatoes, those tiny little potatoes, two right, weeks right. after you see the flowers. So oh. two weeks after they flower, you can start gently digging for new potatoes. They're really, really small. Oh. I don't waste my time with them. I <laughs> wait for so the plants to die. <laughs> I grow my potatoes in containers. The, the, I grow 90% of my potatoes in containers and I overwater the hell out of them. And I've never had that issue. They're never in a potato, they're in a container. So it's like, I mean, it drains real well, but if any potatoes are going to get mush, they're going to be mine because I really water the hell out of them. Mm -hmm. But I have never run into that issue of mush from overwatering mine. Um, what I sometimes do is I let the plant, like the plant will die. Mm -hmm. It'll go through its process and like, you know, turn yellow and die. And I'll dig up potatoes. And sometimes if the plant is still a little bit alive or if there's, you know, potatoes that I have ready to go in, I'll squeeze a second crop in mm -hmm. where I'll dig up the old and put in slips for new and try and get two harvests out of one season. Right. She, Shannon used a phrase, they go through the process. I think that's an important thing that the plant, when the, when the plant dies, it's actually putting extra energy into its roots and that's what mm -hmm. you want to eat. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you get out there while, while it's still green, it's, it hasn't put everything into the potato that it, that it potentially could. Well, Having said that, if you plant a lot, then you might want to eat a few new potatoes while you're waiting for them, the rest of them to really get mature. But I think that there's, uh, Shannon used the phrase, the process, when it's going through right. the process of, of dying, it's actually finishing off the roots for you. That makes perfect sense. That's very clear. What I'll do is I'll just take out two or three. I planted a lot, but then I'll leave the rest and see what happens. Okay, thank you. That was great. Yeah, I, I always let my potatoes die back. And uh, sometimes I let them die back and, and I forget where they are. And I can actually dig them up months later and sometimes even in the spring and find potatoes that are in great shape. Really? Huh. After yeah. the winter? Wow. Yeah. Uh, if you I leave potatoes behind, you can get volunteers the next year. Oh yeah, they'll, they'll grow. In fact, it's impossible to get, I have potatoes all over the garden, unfortunately, because they grow from mist. You don't, you know, you miss them when you dig them up, you, even right. little ones, and they'll grow the next year. So uh, that has happened in the my in that plot and where I'm growing potatoes now, mm -hmm. probably two years ago, I planted some and last year I had a volunteer. And so I wonder if, you know, I try to rotate. I didn't try to plant them there, you know, every year or something. And right. so I wonder if, if I got blight there, I wonder if it's because it's they were, you know, it's too many in a row, especially because the volunteers were there. Yeah. I have no idea how mine are doing this year because I haven't dug any up yet, but uh, you know, uh, the plants are like three feet tall and they're all green. So mm -hmm. I'm very far from digging them up. Right. That makes perfect sense when you're talking about putting the energy into the root, because I mean, that's what happens with all the plants and the potatoes are the root. So yeah, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah, very cool. Michael, does that answer your question? Did yes, you thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. Okay, we have one more question, and this one is from Nicole. Go ahead. I want to talk perennials. Um, I guess I'm trying to set up more roots now than I ever have before, and <clears throat> I, I want to do a perennial flower garden, but I don't even need to talk about that right now. We could just maybe talk about perennial vegetables. So, um, those of you who've been to my space know that we we dug out a, a place for our garden. It's about 28 by 26 feet and it's completely fenced in. And I would love to put things in like, an, you know, a, an asparagus patch. Um, I would love to do some berries in there as well. But I'm just curious to know how other people are doing this. Like how much space do you dedicate? Are you oh. actually edging things out to try to like limit yourself? And does it affect your crop rotation from year to year, like coming, like, what do you do? Like, cause it's not, it's big, but 26 by 28, is not that big. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious to see how everybody else has done their perennial veggies and fruits. Yeah, I would be uh, in a small space, especially with berries. They, they could, uh, especially what you plant. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a really small space. I had to learn some hard lessons. You know, I, raspberries like first year a little bit second year then third year we took over everything and you know it didn't make sense you know i have a 
I'm, I'm growing a lot of perennials in my small space, but uh, that's, I'm like, I'm focusing on that. So, you know, I have asparagus, you know, I'm trying to grow artichoke now, you know, they do, I, I would clear, you know, that's going to take space and time. So, you know, I, I would, I would try to keep it away from the, you know, the annual area because again, especially berries, they will spread like in year two or three, they will take off a, a lot of space. So you might, you might want to have a, maybe another area where you do that. Right. So let's say I keep berries out. I'd really like to do asparagus. And I know that it gets like really tall. Is that, is, would it be proper? I don't, I don't know if proper is the right term, but I'm thinking about doing like a perimeter piece of asparagus so that maybe I can keep it closer or tighter to the fence line, but I'm not even really sure how it grows once it starts going. Yeah. I, I have a row of asparagus. Yeah. And it grows very high, very pretty long, tall ferns. Yeah, I, I, you could keep that somewhat controlled, but again, that will be a, a long path. But yeah, maybe Michael. I know Michael tries to grow a lot of perennials as well, and I don't know. The, uh, build my... You can think of it in terms of uh, what the permacultures like to say. You, you have different zones, and mm -hmm. the uh, perennials are things that they would put further from your house because they would lead, need less attention. Right. You know? And so you might think of, you know, what do you need to get to first and put that closest and then put put that and then um let's see for an asparagus patch i've i've seen your house you have a big deer fence a tall deer fence but i think if you put even up like another four foot fence just beyond that as a perimeter on the outside and you had um um i deer any deer could jump a four foot fence but if you have stuff growing inside and it's not really a wide area we did that for several years just a four foot fence and because the landing area was so landing strip was so narrow inside deer never went inside mm -hmm. they never went inside and so um you could you could do like a like i said an extra outside your current thing and and expand it make sure you pick one of the things we did wrong when we did our asparagus patch was we sort of looked around and say oh that spot looks nice and then years later when we had the deer fence dug i'm what we could see was oh on one side of the yard the soil was really shallow and on the other side of the yard the soil was really deep and we dug our asparagus pit where the soil was really shallow so it was like really working through stone and then you, you know and then you know you sit back and see oh well actually we live on the western ridge of the warwick valley and so you go out our driveway and to the left it goes down into the village and to the right it goes down into i guess a sleepy valley and and so it sort of makes sense that you know the seeing I go like this is because this is the soil line and this is the rock line underneath. And so on one end of the yard where we planted the asparagus, the, the soil is so shallow. And you know, if I had hung out with it and understood things better, I wouldn't have put my asparagus patch there. So anyway, that's another consideration for where to put an asparagus patch. That's, you know, that's where I am now, like not just with the asparagus, with perennials in general. I'm trying to look around and really take note because I know that this is, it's going to be a huge investment, not only monetarily, but in time, you know? So I'm really trying to <clears throat> like, I don't know, are there perennials? Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I mean, the beautiful thing about perennials is, you know, it won't take that much time because once you get it in there, they, it's not like annuals. They, they're going to grow over years. And like also permaculture sometimes as the uh, food forest, right? you know, of having a, you know, a tree, a shrub, a trellising thing, you know, if you could set up an area, you know, like, you know, I have some hazelnuts like Michael has, you know, think about stuff you like. Right. You no, know, you know, trees are much more maintenance, you know, fruit trees, you got to really watch them, they, you know, right. as far as what, light and stuff like that, but sorry. I love that. I'm just, I don't know about, I guess quantity is another question within that as well. Like, cause when you, I've seen so many people plant things, plant perennials, and I guess want to just fill up a lot of space right in the beginning. And then you come back a couple of years later and you're like, wow, this is completely, you know, just congested. It doesn't work. But then I've also seen people plant stuff and it's like, that looks really puny in the space. So is it just another lesson for us gardeners, right? And like- No, Nicole, I think you have to look at what you eat and what you what you value in terms of what you produce. Uh, for my garden, I have about 24, 25 foot beds. Uh, about four or five of them are perennial and it's mostly berries. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it, I use half for a spring planting and then half for the summer planting. And then 
the fall planting is replacing the spring. Right. And mm -hmm. so that's the way I, I run it. But it depends. It, you know, you have to choose what you like to eat and how much. I agree 100% with that, Bill. So you said you have five, what, 20-foot beds? Five 25-foot beds that blueberries, stro two strawberry beds, uh, raspberry bed, uh, asparagus bed. And those, how do you keep, what's your like critter perimeter fence? Like what do you do to keep the bad guys away so you actually eat some of these berries? <laughs> uh, well, we, we use nets over the strawberries, the bird netting. I will use hoops and then the nets. And when, when we pick, we have to lift the nets up and pick. Uh, the same with blueberries. Blueberries are even worse. Uh, the birds will eat them all. Uh, so we have the, the bird netting on a tall, you know, a six, seven foot uh, uh, trellis, essentially protecting them. Uh, raspberries, we found that it, we don't need anything. Uh, the wine berries, the, the wild wine berries come roughly the same time as the raspberries mm -hmm. and the birds just don't really bother them. Mm -hmm. um, and the asparagus, you just have to worry about uh, asparagus beetles and Japanese beetles and you just have to, you know, protect them from those. I do it by hand picking. Mm -hmm. um, the British so. invasion, no, the Japanese invasion <laughs> of the beetles, sorry. All right, but yeah, but Bill's right, you know, think about what you eat, you know, don't think about it because in some place you're going to get a ton of berries, but even then, you know, unless you have a giant amount, like it, you could eat, you could eat all the berries in a, in a week. You know, I, I have, I have a lot of June berries. I pick them all. I put them in sat on there. Like they're kind of done already. You know, like you have to think sometimes perennials, like, you know, as opposed to you growing, you know, 800 tomatoes, which mm -hmm. you'll have and you can can in this, right. you know, even asparagus, you'll clip them and you have them for a few weeks and then, you know, that's done. And then, you, have the, you know, like I'll have, Hopefully, if I grow cherries or peaches, even if they if they do come, they come and then it'll be in a you know a large bunch. So you know, right? Like I'm, Bill says, you know, think about what you as far as, far as your overall picture. You know, I, I try to do both, but it, it is you know I do have a small space, but I, you know I would think about you know I would I would try to not put uh, berries and stuff near your annual. So, you know, again they will they will take over the area. Berries take a lot of room. My granddad had huge beds. You know, Nicole, if you like rhubarb, um, if, you can get, if you can get uh, established roots, it'll give you a crop pretty quickly and deer don't eat it. So you don't have to have it fenced in. <laughs> so, Bonus. That's a miracle. But, uh, right. And then I mean, you got to think, like, like, you know, how, how much rhubarb pie do you want? You know, like I'm saying, so, some things grow <laughs> fantastic and are beautiful, but then you're like, you're never right, going like, to get rid of it. You will have right. rhubarb. I'm, I'm like, rhubarb now. <laughs> yeah, it'll be there forever. Right. But you, you like, say you like, I like some rhubarb. One rhubarb plant will give you enough rhubarb in this, you know, a big rhubarb plant will give you enough rhubarb in the spring to make some stewed rhubarb and make a strawberry rhubarb pie. And you know, they're kind of cool looking dinosaur plants. <laughs> so, so, so try to think of both. Try to think of keeping the annuals and, you know, the perennials around. But, you know, again, you have, unless you have a lot of space, you know, you're probably not going to be able to, you know, eat, you know, survive off, you know, perennial, what you get from the perennials. Even though I, I do love the fact that they just come back. You know, I, I put them in one area. Like now I have the uh, June berries. Mm. And, they, and, and I, I, had, I finally put them in a beautiful spot that nothing, you know, it's in the corner and nothing else can grow there. And I'm like, let them grow as much as they want. And, you know, it's great. But, uh, yeah, but yeah, you're just right. Plan your, air, plan your area out. But I, I would definitely keep your annuals and think about what perennials you really enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, realize unless you have a, a big amount of space, you're just going to get, you know, a limited amount of whatever those perennials are. And you still, everybody, like, everybody... Do you guys irrigate your berry patches and stuff, or do you just let the rain do? Do you support? What do you? What? What's the deal? I, I don't. I don't water my perennials. My, you know, once they're established, I kind of let. I they're on their be. own. And again, the beauty of perennials. This is. Right. That's why. That's why it's not a lot. When you say it's a lot of work, it's not really. You know, once once you establish them. Right. For me, gotta... right. Uh, to be completely honest, the perennials in my vegetable garden are a much smaller concern to me than learning like don't drive by my house and look really close right now because there it's just i need help 
I need <laughs> landscaping help. I've been going to friends' places and I'm like coveting their, it's just so beautiful. And I know that it's just going to take time and intention and just like planting and doing things and committing. So I'm, uh, I got to do some artist renderings or something and really do some plans, but. Yeah, you know, observe, you know, see where sun is, where water is. And, you know, I mean, I, I can see you don't, you know, don't, I'm sure I've seen your backyard. It's beautiful. Don't be, hard, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't you know, look so close, Chad. Don't look so close. No, no. And you had, you had a lot of construction going on. You, you know, you, you had, a, this was a rough year. You had injuries. So, you know, you'll get there. Thank you. Folks, I want to be mindful of the time. It's already 9.08, so we're going to... Nicole, does that answer your question? Well, I, is it for everybody for your input? I really appreciate it. It's okay. okay. I just had a really, really, really quick question. All of my zucchini died because of squash vine borer. Has anybody actually succeeded in sprouting new zucchini? Why can't I get zucchini to sprout? Well, I plant them in succession because the squash borer get it. I mean, I see them in there now. And I've tried surgery, but it doesn't work well. But if you plant, you can still plant zucchini. I just put more in. Yeah, I, I, put in, I put in two seeds in a small pot to sprout. And for some reason, I can never, ever, ever, ever get the zucchini seeds to sprout. And I'm just trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. I put them right in the ground. Build a mound, put six seeds in, water them, and they grow. <laughs> Are they new okay. seeds? Are you saying you're getting no leaves and or no leaves and no flowers, no fruit? They're not sprouting. They're not sprouting. The seed does nothing. Hmm. How long do the seeds? Are they all coming from the same pack? Yeah, they're all the same seed from the same pack. That could be it right. It's a different the pack. <laughs> all right. So build them out, put in six, and don't worry if six come up. Right. Be, be ruthless. <laughs> that point. All right. You know, I don't know how that turns out. It, I, it's warm here, so I'm assuming that my season's a little bit longer down here. So I'm hoping that I can get them to just start because they annihilated in, in a week's time. My zucchini yeah. was dead. No, you have plenty of time to get another crop of zucchini. And yeah. just water them. You, if you want to, depend. We, we've had different amounts of rain. I don't have as much rain here in the village of Warwick as you've had sometimes outside the village. But if you want to get something to go faster, go out there and make sure your seeds stay moist. Mm. And th they should come up in, I don't know, a few days. Mm. All right. Can Maybe. I ask one question really quick? Sorry. Sorry. Our cucumbers have, um, I think it's called anthracnose. It's a, it's a fungal disease. And I want to get some, a fungicide for it. I was ready to go over to Waitsons, and one of our members said that some of the fungicides kill bees. Can anyone recommend? We I already cut off all the bad leaves, so I should be able to get a crop. But does anyone know a fungicide I can use that won't hurt the bees? I was using a soap and water mixture, but that's not an actual fungicide. I was using a soap and water mixture really carefully. Um, and uh, bottom watering because the fungus feed off of water. So you need to water from below, but that, but I wasn't using actual fungicide. Yeah, no, we, we don't, we have um, drip irrigation. And I mean, you have the water from, from the rainstorms. I can't do anything about because at first that's what I thought it was, but it's definitely spread beyond that. But I don't think soap and water is going to stop, uh, you know, it's a, it can be airborne or it can be soil, soil borne. I rotated them from last year, but okay. All right. I'll go read all the labels. <laughs> I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, 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 or bee balm, second year in a row, it's developed a little white dust on it. Oh yeah, that's yeah, normal. Used, that's normal. That's they're prone to powdery mildew. Yeah. That's their Don't thing. Them. So just keep going. Keep going. They'll totally normal. Okay. But I'm, I'm, I think I want to point out, you know, I grew up in normal Illinois and I'm wearing my far from normal t-shirt tonight. <laughs> Very cute. <laughs> Love it. Okay, folks, we're in the home stretch. All this right. Our announcements to wrap things up. The next Zoom garden plot is going to be on Monday, August 9th, again at 8 p.m. 
Um, we wanted to remind everyone that the Triple Win Community Solar is running through the end of July. We just finally signed up. This has been a you know a long haul, but Michael, you'll be so proud of us. We finally did it. <laughs> Woo! Um, and then, of course, um, I don't know if we did find someone to represent us at their discussion. Sarah, are you going along with us? No, I, did. I said I was going. Yeah, I, I'm going. Super, super. So um, that is it from my side. Does anybody else have any last things? I have one quick question. Going back to tools, how diligent is everybody about cleaning their tools and how often? Do you do it after every time you come back from the garden or just when you're cutting something that you know is, is bad? How often do you clean your tools? Clean? Every time I use them usually. What? Yeah, let's uh, let's all do what Michelle just did. <laughs> we're all back. Everybody, Bill, let's Bill, all, Bill, all together Bill now. Bill does a good job, right, Bill? <laughs> oh, Does I'm not the only one. Monty okay. Don, the gardener, the BBC gar on Gardener's World, he has a special tool cleaning ritual, and he makes <laughs> it look like such a wonderful thing. And I'm just like, I can't muster up the enthusiasm for that. Okay. I clean That's them every time though, because I've seen so much and read so much about all the diseases. I figure, you know, I just sit Why? there, put the radio on and wipe it's just them lazy. off. Um, oh, well, sorry, one of the days we clean them, but otherwise like we were clipping the, the uh, cucumber leaves. I brought alcohol and I made everyone clean everything. And I put the leaves in a, in a different bag. I didn't put them in the compost, but otherwise, nah, free for all. <laughs> Okay, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. Just one quick announcement: we are doing uh, food swaps. I should I should announce that uh, every Wednesday by a community garden in Greenwood Lake. That if you have any extra food, as far as cucumbers or you know, whatever you might have, kind of bring them. You can swap with your neighbors, or you could just donate them. And I'm going to bring all extra to the uh, senior center and the uh, food pantry. So uh, that'd be great. Just like a tool library, we could slot that up going all over, you know, no wasted food would be awesome. So it's every Wednesday, 6.30, 7.30 at 13 Poplar Street by our community garden. That's Thanks. wonderful. I will also um, real quick, I've already always seen it and I've never done it, just having like a five gallon bucket with sand in it and people cleaning their tools that way to just kind of keep them sharp and get like just different uh, off. I don't, I mean, I have probably eight different five gallon buckets and sand somewhere but the two have never met in my tools. <laughs> <laughs> I heard of somebody who like at the end of the year, like washes all their tools and like oils them up or something before they put them away for the winter. Has anybody heard of that? Oh, yes. That's I've nice. meant to do it many times. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, thank you for my edge and mulch title on my picture. That is me, edges and mulches. I'm going to need you, Jane. You're going to have to help me with my perennials because I have no idea how to edge for all of this. I'll be in touch. You got okay, it. Okay, everybody. So that is the extent of tonight's presentation. I want to thank you for your enthusiastic participation. Um, please feel free to send in any questions, any pictures, updates, whatever you want to share. I feel like it really encourages community participation when, you, when we do that. And we all love to see what everybody else is doing. And especially if you have any tool suggestions for the, for the Florida Public Library, send them along and we will pass them along to Baron. Okay. All right then. And with that, I'll say good night. And see you in two weeks. Good night. Good night.